This is the lecture for Ancient and Medieval History for Tuesday, the 25th of January 2021. You all should have notebooks or note packs out and be ready to go. First off, let's see if we have... Ah, your syllabus. <coughs> you will note that your syllabus has been corrected to reflect the fact that we have a single second semester stu uh, case study and not two. Therefore, you do not have case study work due in a couple of weeks. You have case study work. Your 50 fact sheet is due Monday, May 9th, and your case study is due Monday, May 23rd. Now, having been through one of these before, if you are still foolish enough nay, stupid enough, to leave your case study work to the last minute. You will deserve what you get, especially as I grade more harshly, because um, you have been through it before. You have an extra credit for third quarter. Let's see. So, any questions on your syllabus update? I see none. Okay, next... I've had a series of questions over the last day or two about an issue in current events in foreign affairs. And I thought that I would hit some of the high points before we go into today. The Ukraine is the region north of the Black Sea. It is largely open plains, which means it doesn't have natural borders. There are rivers to the east, the Don and the Donets, but in general terms, it is open plains. Now, Poland once ruled part of it. Romania coveted lands that are now called Moldova, that traditionally are called Bessarabia. But the Russians took the lands from the Tatars, the uh, Mongols, uh, in the time of Catherine the Great in the late 18, or in the late 1700s. Now, what they did to this land, the Ukraine, is they made it into their breadbasket. What that means is that the primary products of this region are really, really, really big crops of wheat and potatoes. <coughs> the Ukrainians are called by the Russians Little Russians, which doesn't please the Ukrainians one bit. The Ukrainians uh, are a distinct Slavic people that the Russians see as a subset of them, that the Ukrainians see as a completely different group. But Ukraine has been, the Ukraine has been under the rule of the Tsars and the Commissars since around the time of the American Revolution. In World War I, as Russia fell apart under the blows of the fall of the Tsar, the conquest of the Germans, and the Communist Revolution, the Ukraine had a brief period of independence under no less than six different governments which lasted a total of maybe two or three years. And then the Soviets returned the Ukraine to Russian dominion. In World War II, the Soviets used to joke about how they would use the Ukrainians as cannon fodder. If they had an area they suspected was a minefield, they'd march some Ukrainians through it and see if they would uh, explode. And if they did, they knew there were mines and great Russians, which the Russians call themselves, would go around. When the Soviets finally fell in the early 1990s, the Ukraine regained its independence and includes, as part of its sovereign territory, the Crimean Peninsula, which dangles into the Black Sea. About a decade ago, under President Obama, the United States watched as Putin's Russia marched into the Crimea. Obama talked diplomacy, 
and did nothing. And the Russians gained the Crimea. For the last 10 years, Putin's Russia has been infringing upon eastern Ukrainian territory, incorporating it, in fact, if not in name, into the Russian Federation. The world has talked, but done nothing. Over the past year, Putin is not the only aggressor who has been emboldened by what they perceive to be American weakness under the current administration. This is not a political statement. You know how I feel about the current president. I'm not a fan. I am telling you in objective terms that President Biden appears weak and that other leaders in Iran, in North Korea, in China, and in Russia are preparing to take advantage of this weakness, as they perceived Obama to be weak. So, for the past few months, Putin's Russian Federation has massed troops in eastern Ukraine. Hundreds of thousands of them. For what looks like the conquest of the rest of the country. Now, there may be some diplomatic shell game played, where the Russians march in and install a proper Ukrainian government, which will be a puppet, and where Russia will try to make believe that the Ukraine occupied by Russian troops is independent, and just its government happens to have changed its opinion about Russia, and is now going to be bestest buddies with Putin. That's like a wife who's caught in flagrante delecto with the pool boy, saying to her horrified husband, it was an accident. We were having a tickle fight. Who are you going to believe, me or your eyes? And what she's really saying is, if you believe your eyes, the marriage is over, life changes. If you believe me, I'll owe you one. And we can live the lie together. It's entirely likely that depending upon how bloody the invasion may be, Putin will try to play a game whereby he restores the independence of Ukraine by making it beholden to Russia, inviting the rest of the world to wink and nod and play along. There are some factors relating to this. Number one, Putin is KGB has been for his whole adult life. The KGB is the Gestapo of the Soviet Union. One does not retire from the KGB. One is simply assigned fewer active duties. So Putin's worldview is a Soviet worldview, uh, wedded to Russian nationalism. And when the Soviets fell apart, they lost a bunch of territory. Two weeks ago, in, South, in Central Asia, a government in Kazakhstan that was about to be overthrown by a popular revolution, in other words, by people in the streets wanting freedom, begged Russia to send troops in to stabilize things, and Putin agreed, and the world did nothing. <clears throat> That's not years ago. That's not even months ago. That's two weeks ago. Second factor, Western and Central Europe do not have oil. They have coal, but thanks to environmental regulation, their use of coal is, is, is deeply restricted by the European Union, by the international community, and by the politics of the, each of those nations. So instead of using coal, which they see as dirty, it isn't always, but they see it as, and instead of using nuclear power, because, well, uh, Fukushima and Three Mile Island and Chernobyl are only a few of the most public nuclear disasters. This nuclear power seemed to be unsafe. More and more, Europe is using natural gas, pumped from Russia by pipeline. Now, during Trump's presidency, he invited to Europe to consider an American alternative. We have massive stores of natural gas, and we've learned how to liquefy it and ship it in ships. 
Now, you don't want liquefied natural gas to explode. It, it basically is one of the hottest explosions that you'll get outside of an atomic blast. But we could have been shipping tankers filled with LNG, liquefied natural gas, to Europe uh, by now. And if we had done so, Europe would have an alternative. But Europe right now doesn't. It chose not to accept American liquid natural gas. With the result being that during the winter time, when people are cold in Europe, because they're in the Northern Hemisphere, um, if they make too much trouble for Vladimir Putin, he'll simply shut off the spigot. And they won't have their gas. And without, liquefied, or without natural gas being piped in from Russia, the economies of Western Europe and Central Europe will uh, grind to a halt. So if the Russians move into the Ukraine, Despite the fact that it will be a, it will set a precedent that aggressors are having a field day and a free hand, like they haven't had since the 1930s, which led to World War II, many in Europe will argue for patience and restraint and tolerance of Putin's conquest, because otherwise they'll get their fuel shut off. The Germans are particularly prone to this. President Biden has blown hot and cold on this issue, but had, last week in a press conference, he practically said that if Russia wants to move into the Ukraine, it's inevitable. He shrugged his head and basically said, if it's a minor incursion, you know, what are you going to do? Well, anything can be pitched as a minor incursion, including whole tank armies of hundreds of thousands of men. Minor incursion compared to what could have happened. I suppose. It's all war games. That is not what you want to do. Just before the Korean War, an American Secretary of State, Dean Asheson, while in East Asia, listed the American sphere of influence in East Asia and accidentally omitted South Korea. Less than two months later, North Korea invaded South Korea. There are to this day people in the United States and around the world who blame the Secretary of State, Gene At Dean Atchison, for sending a signal to Pyongyang and Moscow that uh, South Korea wasn't an area of vital American interest and therefore they could invade it and conquer it and we would let them do it. It is possible that Biden's press conference last week did the same thing, giving a final green light to Putin. I don't know. He hasn't seemed to move yet. But he's on the verge. It's like somebody holding a gun to another person's head with their finger tightly on the trigger and the hammer trembling, ready to go back and kaboom. So the world waits. If Putin is allowed to get away with attacking Ukraine and conquering it, why wouldn't the Iranians move against Israel? The only thing that's been holding them back is fear of an American military reprisal. Why wouldn't the Chinese move against Taiwan? The only thing holding them back is the fear of starting a world war. Why wouldn't the North Koreans consider adventuring in South Korea? The only thing holding them back is the fear of military reprisal from us, the United States. Why? Because since the fall of the British Empire and since the fall of the Soviets, especially, we've been the policemen of the world. And what you can see looking at American cities is if you send the police home or defund them or have prosecutors who won't prosecute violent crimes, uh, criminals will take advantage. If there are no police, the criminals will come out and do what they want to do, because they can. On the other hand, if the United States intervenes, we could be looking at a, a full-scale war between industrial powers, which we haven't seen since 1945. It could lead to a world war. Uh, also, if we intervene and fail and look pathetic, that will also encourage the Iranians and the North Koreans and the Chinese and their villainy. What this is, is a dangerous situation. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. So, do you have any questions about it before we move into today's lesson? So Americans kind of trapped in a corner with the options they have to do. American deterrence 
has been one of the things that has kept the peace since World War II, in the free world, in the Cold War, and since. Right now, for better or worse, I'm trying to say this in as neutral and fair way as I can, we have an American president and administration which is not at the top of its game. They themselves admit that. And which is not interested in being the policeman of the world. At the same time, they understand that what letting Ukraine be conquered without, without making Russia pay for it in some way um, would send a green light around the world. But do we want to send Americans to fight and die for an Eastern European country that probably can't be defended unless we go in full force? Yeah, we're in a bad spot. What we have to do, I think, is project to Putin that if he goes in, he'll be in a worse spot. That we will make him pay financially, that we will make him pay diplomatically, and that we will make him pay even militarily. But to do that requires vision, courage, a willingness to stand up. And I'm concerned about the possibility of war. Yeah. But I'm also concerned about the possibility of appeasement. You'll learn next year that in September of 1938, the world was on the brink of a second world war because Hitler wanted the mountain region between Germany and Czechoslovakia, which was part of Czechoslovakia, but inhabited by some Germans. The Czechs said, bite me, come and get it. The Russians, the Russian communists said, well, we're in uh, fighting the fascists. The British and the French had previously, 20 years before, almost uh, 15 years before, guaranteed the borders of Czechoslovakia. So had Germany invaded, they would have been in a war with Britain, France, the Czechs, in the mountains, defending the mountains, and even the Soviets. And the Poles might have gotten involved, too, against the Germans. A man of peace, for better or worse, Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister of Britain, despite the treaty obligations he had, flew to Germany, and at the Munich conference gave away the mountainous region of Czechoslovakia without consulting the Czechs. When Britain gave it away, the French went along with the British. The Russians got so disgusted that a year later they made a treaty with Germany. The communists and fascists, who supposedly hate one another, became partners in dividing Eastern Europe between them. And when war finally came in September of 1939, a year later, it wasn't a war where Germany was fighting five or six powers surrounding it. It was a <coughs> war where Germany quickly conquered Poland, France, and conquered everything from the Pyrenees Spanish border of France all the way to the outskirts of Moscow. They came this close to conquering Britain and the Middle East and the world. So Chamberlain bought peace. <coughs> But what he also bought was a much bigger, much greater, much more scary war than probably would have happened in 38. One of my concerns is that we may arrange some peace with Russia in control of the Ukraine. That will produce a much worse war in the future than we would have if we fought now. None of these things are for certain. The, the realities of situations like this is there's an existential uncertainty about them. What you're literally doing is you're playing pool with planets. You're, 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 you're engaging in brink, brinksmanship in a world that has plenty of atomic weapons. It's, 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 it's an interesting situation in the Chinese sense. And interesting times are curses as far as the Chinese tradition goes. Did that answer your question? Sir? Uh, didn't the Prime Minister come back like, oh shit, and then it said, mission accomplished? Now that was, okay, you're confusing two things. Yeah. When we conquered Iraq in 2003, President Bush lands on a carrier. He's a pilot, oh. so he actually did the landing. And he said, mission accomplished. And in terms of conquering Iraq, we had. In terms of pacifying it, we had. It. So Bush looked like an idiot in retrospect. In 1938, Chamberlain flies back from Munich. He lands at Croydon Airport, south of London holds a paper in his hand in front of all the newsreel cameras and says, this paper bears the signature of, of, of Herr Hitler and myself. And it says that the British Prime Minister and the German Chancellor and Fuhrer promise that the English and German peoples have no reason to fight a war and will have peace into the future. He then goes on to say, this 
will guarantee peace in our time. Yeah. And peace in our time is one of the most infamous phrases. Yeah. Because it wasn't peace. It basically built a bigger war to come. A war where Russia starts out on Germany's side. Uh, and the only reason Russia changed sides is Germany invades Russia in June of 41. Um, so, yeah, uh, that that was a, those are two moments. One that I think the Bush thing is embarrassing. The Chamberlain thing is tragic. Really tragic. I'm not trying to scare you. The truth is the world has always been going through stuff like this. The question is, are you aware of it or not? Um, and as you get older, people get more aware of it. I have some historical perspective. I don't have all the wisdom on this. I have some historical perspective. I'm happy to share it with you. That's why I brought this up. This is kind of off topic in the group. Earlier you talked about nuclear power yeah. and like three mile island and stuff. How do you feel about nuclear power? How do you think that people should feel about it? Okay, people are gonna make their own minds up. I don't presume to tell other people what to think or feel about things. I think nuclear power is perfectly safe if you have good people in charge. But I think the best nuclear power plants are not to be found in these giant land facilities with the towers. The best nuclear power plants are the Rickover nuclear power plants that we use in American nuclear submarines. They're much smaller, they're much more controllable, they are much safer. Now, they don't put out the same power output as the giant land plants, but I think they're much safer. So if I were king of the world, first of all, I would build dams everywhere I could. I believe hydroelectric power is the best form of power you could have. I would dig for more oil. I would use fracking to get shale, or, or shale oil. I would use clean coal. And I would build a bunch of small brickover nuclear plants to supplement our power grid. Most of all, though, what I would do is try to protect our power grid against electromagnetic pulse attacks, because I think that there's a temptation that somebody might have at some point to zap our power grid, and everything that isn't military is basically wide open at this point. So for me, I, I, I hate this expression because it's a political slogan, but I guess I, in fact, do have an all-of-the-above approach to energy. What do you think about it? I don't know. I think that we should go. I think that nuclear is the future. If we develop fusion power... Well, China built a nuclear fusion reactor. <laughs> I wouldn't trust it. The Chinese kind of lie yeah, about their accomplishments like, sometimes. Like how there's no COVID cases. Yeah, yeah, China. yeah, yeah. It's, um, and there's like no poverty. In oh, no, 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 no. They brought hundreds of, actually billions of people out of poverty. Uh, I, uh, I, they also built the biggest hydro plant in the world, uh, the Three Gorges Dam. And it almost fell apart last summer or last spring during the rainy season. And we got another rainy season coming up. So ah, the, the Chinese Communist Party does not, they build these grandiose projects, but they don't build them very well. No. Um, they like entire apartment. Like yeah, they just crack and, and then <laughs> it's There's bad. like train tracks on the roofs of apartment buildings yeah. and stuff there yeah. because they're just like terrible. Yeah, it, it's, it, it is not a situation I would want to be in. Let's put it that way. I, I think that there are valid concerns about atomic power. For example, uh, every nuclear power plant we use is a steam power plant. It involves heating water. And the problem is when you heat water using an atomic pile, it becomes radioactive. This is called radioactive waste. And one of the great problems of anyone who uses atomic power is, what do you do with all that radiated water? You've got drums of it. What we tried to do is hollow out a mountain in the central Rockies and basically put it in a giant granite tomb and seal it away from the water table. But that was too expensive, and the people who lived near there didn't like it, so I, I don't think that's been done. You just throw it in so, space. So, yeah, well, there's another thing, until you, or unless you have space problems. One of my favorite science fiction TV shows from the 70s, Space 1999, about the future, posited we sent all our radioactive waste to the moon, but then it all through an electromagnetic firestorm exploded and shot the moon out of orbit. <laughs> not not the moon. You would like you would make like a nuclear fusion rocket that would go for like a Well you throw it at the sun. sun. That's what you do. You just send well, all this no, stuff. No, that's the dangerous sun. too. I don't ah, want to throw it at the sun. Ah. Just throw it off somewhere where there where there's like no planets, just some like rain. Yeah, but eventually the orbit something will happen yeah, and then it'll rain down. Right. Look, 
and the truth is, there is no such thing as a free lunch when it comes to power. Either you're going to mess with a river, or you're going to create carbon emissions, or you're going to create atomic, you know, nuclear waste. So there's there's no easy way unless you get a bunch of hamsters to run around on hamster wheels and produce power that way. Which, granted, the evil part of me would find funny, but you know, you're not supposed to. How much power could that be? Uh, not, not much. Not much. Not yeah. Would you say that the current situation right now is more of a political, like, a more of a political battle than a like, physical war? For the moment, yes, because for the moment, Vladimir Putin hasn't yet pulled the trigger. So it's a question of wills. It's like in an old Western movie. You've got two gunfighters staring each other in the eye, and they're both ready to shoot. <laughs> and it, this is also called a Mexican standoff. Mm -hmm. And who, whoever blinks first, <clears throat> they both then try to shoot one another. So we're in that moment of Mexican standoff. The problem is it will quickly become a military thing if Putin pulls the trigger. And we don't know what a post-1945 war looks like when you're talking between major powers. We haven't had that. We've been very lucky. Um, what echoes through the back of my mind is the last few moments of the 1968 movie Planet of the Apes. Ooh, that was a good one. It's a good one. And it's, I saw it as a child, scared the living hell out of me. Um, if you've not seen it, you should see it. I'm not going to spoil the ending. Uh, I, I will simply say <coughs> that there are fewer, more eloquent pines against nuclear war than Charlton Heston's final words in that movie. It's just beautifully done. And I hope we can avoid all that. I, I believe that the self-interest of the people involved will probably see us through. Because the Russians still have a memory of losing 30 million people as a result of World War II, and they don't want that to happen again. Now, many of the people who lived through that are dead, but they still have this echo. What scares me about the Chinese leadership is they have no memory of that at all, <coughs> and therefore it's not part of their zeitgeist. That's a fancy word for their way of looking at them. Um, any other questions from any other people? Yet. Okay. Russian there. So, where we are. Rome has won the Punic Wars. Yay! Uh, and Carthage is the Lenda. Est de Lenda. Cartago de Est de Lenda, I guess. I, I'm sure Mr. Williams would find many faults with my Latin. Rome has achieved everything it could possibly want. Everything. Now, I'm going to ask you, because you're well-read people, you've seen movies, you've... Is it possible for a person to get everything they say they want and to have that success destroy them? Is it possible to wish from a genie three wishes that you think will make your life better and those wishes will actually be the thing that ends you? Because in a sense, this is what happens to Rome. Rome has been afraid of a few things. It's been afraid of the Gauls coming from north of the mountains, and they conquered the Gauls uh, south of the mountains, and they even conquered the area between Spain and uh, Italy because they also control Spain. So the Gauls are, Gauls are no longer a threat. And the Romans have been afraid of Carthage because Carthage and Rome have been like staring at each other across the western Mediterranean Sea, and now Carthage is destroyed, and Rome is free to pursue its <coughs> destiny. In the East, because Greek countries in the East are decadent and weak and ripe for conquest. And the Romans aren't going to be threatened by them because the Greeks don't have the ability to project power the way the Romans do. So the Romans have achieved their heart's desire in, in, in beating Carthage, and they're in the process of moving East. But there's a price to their success, and it's more success. Now, let me tell, I'll explain. This is a story that is axiomatic. It is a story that is told again and again and again throughout this time in Roman history. Is it an urban legend? Is it based in fact? Yeah, it's based in the facts of thousands of people, uh, people's experiences. So here's the story that is told again and again. Um, Tertius, 
third born son of a family is from a family of Roman plebeian farmers. And his family has part of a valley, and it's got some orchards, and it's got some fields, and it's got some cattle, and it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a working farm. They make ends meet. They're able to be independent. That's Tertius's legacy. But Tertius is a Roman citizen. So when war comes, Tertius goes off to war, whether it's to fight Hannibal or whoever. And the war goes on for about 20 years. Tertius is needed. He can't go home. So he fights, and he survives. And he becomes not only a soldier and an engineer, which all Roman legionaries are, he learns this trade of a weaponsmith. He's not just a blacksmith. He's a weaponsmith. He not only can shape iron into steel, but he can make high-quality swords and spear tips and all the various panoply of things that go into the Roman arsenal. He's a weaponsmith. He even is a passable armorsmith. So he's a highly skilled guy. And finally, after two decades with the standards, Tertius is ready to come home. Now, Tertius, like most Romans, is, is illiterate. So he hasn't been able to write and the family doesn't know how to read or write either. So he's, he's basically been hoping that everything back home is okay. But when Tertius, um, in his new civilian getup, is heading towards his home valley, when he crosses the ridge that gives him a good overview of the valley, he feels lost. Instead of a forested valley with patches of family farms all around it, and a central road with a central stream, he sees vast open fields, wheat fields upon wheat fields upon wheat fields. He sees, he sees an entire corner of the valley, this massive cattle enclosure and pastures. And in the distance, he sees the signs of a, of a latifundia, a massive country villa. I mean, rich. So he goes down into the valley on the road, which is the same road, sort of numb. He doesn't know what he's going to do exactly. And he comes to the little brook that comes from the right, which indicates where his farm should be. So he gets off the road, crosses the wall, and follows the stream and there's a patch of rough ground with an open cellar hole. That open cellar hole indicates where his home used to be. But there's no sign of the home except for the open cellar hole. Everything else, the orchards, the, the garden, are part of these massive wheat fields. No sign of his family. It's as if they never were. Oh, I can't because of the, the, since the heat has been broken, we're stuck at a certain temperature. It will get warmer, I'm sorry. In any case, I'll always bring extra clothing. Um, so he goes back down the brook to the road and goes up to the villa house, the mansion, the, the Latifundia. Well, Latifundia is the entire plantation. And he knocks on the gate. And uh, uh, sort of a butler comes out, and Tertius identifies himself, <coughs> and he's it's my family's farm. And the butler says, wait, wait here. Bring food, bring drink. He doesn't invite him in, but he goes out with him, a little table and chairs are set up, and the butler sits down with Tertius and explains, I know your family. Your family is one of the dozen farms, uh, family farm, farm families that lived in this valley. And all of their stories are, are very similar, so I'll just tell you. After you left, they did their best, but they didn't have a man around to do the heavy lifting on the farm. So they needed to hire hands, and that meant money, and uh, they didn't have money. Farmers 
usually don't have a lot of ready cash. That's true today. So they took a loan out. In fact, all of the farmers in the valley took loans out from, from my master, my lord, the lot of fundista, the, the plantation owner. And uh, for a while, they kept up with their payments, but eventually they all fell behind. And per the contract, our, my master took possession of the land. Now, he offered everyone here a chance to remain in the valley as tenant farmers, basically as his peasants. Your family said, no, They're proud people. I respect that. We think they went to Rome. We think you can find them there. I'm sorry, that's all I can tell you. So, Tertius feels like he did the last time he had a head wound. He staggers back up through the valley and makes his way to Rome. And Rome is a city of between three quarters of a, you know, three quarters of a million people and, and growing. <sighs> Finding a needle in a haystack would be child's play. But Tertius remembers Skewola. Skewola was an officer who Tertius saved his life. Skewola and Perseus and, and, and Tertius, not Perseus, uh, were battle buddies. They were comrades. Tertius was uh, basically blacksmith and aide and. Skewola owed Tertius his life, so since Skewola came from a wealthy family, a senatorial family, uh, Tertius thought that he'd ask around for Skewola, which he does. And he finds Skewola's townhouse, beautiful townhouse on the Palatine Hill, and uh, he knocks and says who he is, and the servants let him in. And in the lobby of the uh, uh, townhouse, there are all these people waiting around. Just waiting. It's weird. All people of all kinds. And then from up, you know, uh, from from the back of the house, uh, uh, who's here? Really? And doom, 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 and and down comes Skewola and uh, hugs Perse uh, Tertius and slaps him on the back, and they do the Roman handshake, and they're you know, hey, tell me about life. How's how's civilian life treating you? And uh, Skewola invites uh, Tertius into his study and and treats him with honor. And after they exchange pleasantries, Skewola says, is there something I can do for you? Tertius loses it. He just, my family, my farm, he tells the story. Skewola stops him after a few minutes and says, look, don't you worry about anything. I've got a friend who owns an inn. You've got a room there. Don't worry about payment. I'll take care of it just out of friendship. And look for a job. <clears throat> You're a skilled man. You've got a lot to offer. Just get a job and I'll look for your family. I have lots of people who are going to help. It's going to be fine. I'll find If they're here in Rome, I'll find your family. If they're not in Rome, I'll look beyond Rome. Don't worry. So Tertius accepts the gift of the room. And he still got money from his service, and he goes to the inn, and, and, and he trusts his friend and starts looking for work. But again and again, he comes to the same brick wall. Lots of brick walls in Rome. Rome was made of brick at this time. Tertius goes to the blacksmiths and presents his credentials. And shows a couple of the things that he made in the army, which he still has. And it's clear this guy is a master weaponsmith. He can do anything in a blacksmithy that you need done. But again and again, the owners of the smithies say, look, you are the kind of guy I would love to have work here. The problem is, look around you, you see all these productive people? They're not free men, they're slaves. I don't have to pay them. I don't have to treat them beyond a certain minimal point. They're livestock. I buy them. I feed them. I shelter them. When they wear out, I throw them away and I get new ones. If I hire you, don't want to be thrown away. It's a slave. If I hire you, 
I'm going to have to pay you a decent wage because you've got skills. And you're a hero. Thank you for your service. But where am I going to get the money to pay you? I'll have to raise the price of my goods. And if I raise the price of my goods, my competitors will eat me alive. My customers will go elsewhere. Why should they pay an extra 25% for a nail or for a hammer when they don't have to? I can't use you. No matter how much I want you, no matter how good you are, I can't use you. Which is ironic because slaves come from prisoners of war. Tercius's army victories captured all those enemy soldiers that flooded Rome with so many slaves that everyone uses them now. Everyone. And because everyone uses slave labor, from smithy to smithy to smithy, Tertius goes and hears the same basic story, and he cannot find a job. And his money is beginning to slowly run out. It's like two months of this. It's demoralizing. And finally he gets word from Scaevola to come to the, 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 to the townhouse. So Tertius goes, and he sees all the people in the lobby again, and uh, the servants usher him into the study, and Scaevola is there with a big smile. I found your family. They're in the next room. And the door is opened, and his wife, who he hasn't seen in 20 years, and his adult children, they're all there. They hug, and they... They kiss, and, and Skewola has a feast for them. It's, it's a big celebration. But after the women and children, and uh, the adult children now, go to bed, Tertius ex admits his failure. I can't find work. I don't know what I can do. Everyone's using slaves. No one's using free men anymore. Skewola says, I, I was afraid of this. Don't worry. I can always use a man like you on my payroll. Here's what I propose. I'll be your patron. You'll be my client. You and your family will not want for anything. You'll have a nice home. You'll have a nice income. All I want in return is that you show up on every day that's not a holy day and wait in the lobby. And if I have work for you, you'll do it. And if I don't have work for you, by noontime or so, you, you can go about your life. I'll take care of your income. You will provide me with fair service for that. It's going to be fine. And your, 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 your grandchildren will get apprenticed in, in good trades, and it's going to be fine. Don't worry about anything. Tertius doesn't want to accept this. He's a proud man. He's an independent farmer. He's a soldier. He's earned a retirement. He's earned a happy ending. And this is not a happy ending. Exactly. It's better than starving in the streets with his family, but it's, it's, it's still it's not what he wanted. So, of course, he accepts because he has no choice. So now Tertius <coughs> spends his days waiting on Skewola. And if Skewola needs a blacksmith, Perseus is there, Perseus is there. If Scavola needs somebody to go to a speech and cheer or boost, uh, Perseus is there. If Scavola needs somebody to uh, start a riot, uh, Perseus is there. If Scavola needs somebody to collect money from people that owe Scavola money, Perseus is there to be the enforcer. If anyone threatens Scavola's family or friends or clients, Tertius is there for payback. Tertius is no longer free. He's still legally a Roman citizen. He gets to vote the way Scavola wants him to vote. Do you see the change in his life? From being a proud, independent family farmer and a proud soldier and a weaponsmith, Tertius has now become basically a servant. And that's his future until he dies. That story is told again and again and again. It happens over and over and over because there are so many slaves because of Rome's so many victories. And the old plebeian class 
is either being raised up into the patrician class in every way except name, or they're being knocked down into the proletarians, which is a new, a new group. Proletarians are the urban poor, the Roman mob. That's the definition I would have you know. Proletarians are the urban poor, the Roman mob. The urban poor, the Roman mob. The proletarians are free Romans, Roman citizens, who are completely dependent upon wealthy patrons for everything. The urban poor, the Roman mob. And as time goes on after the Second Punic War, these new social classes within Rome, under the patricians, under the people who call themselves plebeians, but are actually more wealthy than not, you have the proletarians and you have the slaves. The slaves are disposable people that you use for whatever. And the, the proletarians are useful for their votes and they're useful for street violence and they're useful to buy products. If you have a friend who, who just wrote a book, you know, your clients will all buy a copy of the book where they get the money, they get the money from you, it's not real. And this corrupts Rome. Until this point, Rome had been a society where even the rich took risks in battle, worked on the farm like King Canatus. But now we begin to see, because of slavery, Romans become more and more and more distant <laughs> to the work that makes their lifestyle possible. And so the proletarians don't really work. They're available to do things for their patrons, but they don't have income that can support them. The slaves do all the work. So the Romans have more and more free time. What are they going to do with that free time? Well, for a while, what they're going to do is they're going to engage in politics, which is going to make politics more dangerous and more violent. The rich become so rich, these latifundistas, these plantation owners, they own valleys, they own areas the size of city-states that are their personal property. They own thousands of slaves. They have hundreds of proles, uh, proletarians at their disposal. They have townhouses in the city and villas in the countryside. You know, I could have said Scavola ended up being the guy who bought the valley, but that would have been too trite. But it might have been. The virtuous Roman citizen becomes more of a myth than ever. The hard-working Roman, the brave Roman, the Roman who has calloused hands, the Romans who had Roman who has battle scars, the Roman who eats oatmeal, two you know one or two meals a day, the the Roman who is abstemious, uh, who doesn't have luxuries. All of that begins to become a myth from the past of the good old days. And in reality, Romans become more and more willing to let slaves do everything for them, and they become more and more detached from reality, and more and more if they can afford it, which a bunch of people can, luxury level. Now, this crisis is going to bring about two political parties. The optimates are the party of the wealthy and the powerful. The optimates are the party of the senators and of the rich plebeians. The optimates are the party of the wealthy and the powerful. The, the word means the best and brightest. So the optimates are the best of the best of the best, sir. And the other party is the populares. The populares are the popular party, the people's party. And the, the so-called people's party are a party representing the interests of the poor, and working class, the proletarians, and the poorer plebeians. And they are going to have very different approaches to solving Rome's problems. So Rome now has factions. 
political parties. The optimates and the populares, and both are run by wealthy people. Populares aren't run by the poor. They're run by wealthy people who think in a certain way, and the optimates are run by wealthy people who think in another way. And both parties have thousands of proletarians at their disposal who will vote as they're told and who will go into the streets and bust heads when they need to. And this is going to change Rome. It's all because of Rome's success. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? We will leave things there. Thank you for your attention. You may talk <coughs> amongst yourselves until this missing. Bye.